again. And now we have on this stage Roland and he will uh, tell us something about um, yeah, giving editors an intuitive uh, editing experience. And I'm pretty excited about this talk. I talked uh, with him yesterday uh, while he was still um, working on his uh, slides. Uh, so I will be um, yes, excited to see what code examples he will present us. So give it up for Roland. Hello. Delivering an intuitive editing ex experience is key for your editors to build great websites. Now, the editing experience is one of the best features of NEOS, and we can do a lot with NEOS. But while we as editors love these features, inline editing and React UI and everything, editors don't really care about it. As an editor of the website, you have to make sure that the content of the website is up to date. But it's not only about adding new content. You have to make sure that content is still accurate, you have to delete old content, you have to check for grammar, styles. So there's a lot to think about. And editors just don't want to think about the software. So they're not focused on Neos. They are focused on content. And you might think, but look at my beautiful software. Neos is so cool and what I've built with Neos. But they don't care. And you probably have had similar experiences. Um, so I know it from my personal experience. Sometimes I'm confused how to open a door, and I feel confused, and I feel stupid, and maybe even a bit embarrassed, because to have to pull it, to have to push it, how does the door work? And it's a door. So there are many examples of doors who are not easy to understand. But must doors be so complicated? No. There's a very simple way to make doors easy to use. If it's something flat, you can push. You will push open the door. If it's something you can grab, you want to grab and pull the door. You don't need labels or any explanations. It's obvious how to use it. Now, that's the goal for building a website uh, editing interface. It should be as easy as possible. So, don't make me think about doors. Don't make me think about Neos. Um, a bit about myself. I'm Roland Schütz. I'm a developer and UX enthusiast. 
I'm um, working in a web agency in Vienna. We were specialized on NEOS, and I'm a core team member since 2018. So in this talk, um, I want to help you help editors focus on content. And we'll have a few topics how, how we do that. Just to get a bit of a feeling, um, how many of you would consider yourself beginner, intermediate, advanced? All right. And if you have to choose between backend and frontend, who would see yourself more as frontend, developer, and backend? All right. Cool, cool. So that, that's good. Um, I think I have some very good ideas for you. So in the talk, I want to cover five areas. First, how can we take the perspective of an editor, think in, the, in their way? Then how we, can we build um, easy to understand node types um, by guiding people through the editing experience, uh, applying constraints for node types, and keeping your content structure flat. Then we'll discuss how we can have a clean user interface by explaining properties well, um, oops. Uh, making the inspector a bit more fun and easy to use, and how to hide unnecessary properties. Then we'll take a look more at, uh, at the fusion part, and we'll make sure that no types are rendered in the back end in an easy to understand way. Uh, being more predictable and anticipatable, so you, editors can get what they, what, they will, what they can do with no types. And we'll discuss when the inlet editing experience should be augmented in the back end and not look exactly the same as in the front end. In the end, and uh, that's my favorite part, we'll play even more with some fusion and we'll figure out how we can set social media images by default how we can profit from resource metadata, which you can find in the media browser, and how to build smarter layouts. So let's, let's enable editors to focus on what is important, content. Um, it's very important that you understand what editors will be using your website before you even start to develop. So what language do your editor speak? Um, is it always the same language? Then you can just make all labels in one language. Or do you have editors who only speak French or English or only German? And then you might need to have all your labels translated. Um, also, and that's very important, what kind of words do your editors use? Normally, they are not as technical as the language we speak. So editors often don't really understand what a backend is. They are used to a word like administration area. And when they create a note type, they want to create a note type called newsletter subscribe form, and they do not expect a MailChimp JavaScript integration. So try to take words where your editors are used to. And then the really important question, and there's no wrong or right, it really depends on your editors, how much do they understand about web technologies, and how much do they want to make designs, or do they just want to add content? So do you want to build a very simple experience where they can put in responsive components and it just looks always nice? Or do they want to have something like Photoshop where you can nitpick every spacing and every detail? And it's really important to understand what your editors expect and when they are overwhelmed. So the whole talk is about thinking in this perspective. What does your ad editor expect and how can we deliver it? And now we're getting more technical and more technical along the way. So the first is, how can we build easy to understand node types? In in our code, it often is very clear what the difference is between um, different node types, while for editors, it can be complicated. 
So as an editor, you start with the node creation dialog. And you're clicking, I want to create a content. And then you see something like this. And it's really hard to figure out, OK, we, what kind of node type do I want to have here? Do I want to have the headline or the text or the headline with text or the headline with text and map or the center text? It can be overwhelming. So you often find things like this. There's a headline, and then we needed something else. So we have a headline two. And then a designer designed some really fancy thing, and we call it headline special. But as an editor, let's say you just started in a job. I don't know what does that mean. So there's a very, a very good pattern. Create only one node type, which is called headline. And then if I click on the headline, I can choose the layout. And here it would say headline for a section, um, headline on a uh, gray background, best used after a teaser element, or headline with a company logo um, in the background, which makes simple text pages more easy and more, more interesting. And now, as an editor, when I'm using it the first time, I have a very good understanding of what I can expect. And then, if I have created the headline, entered the content, and I don't like the layout, I can just switch the layout later on. So it's easier for editors to use. And um, it's, even, it's also good to explain the use cases. So I've done it a bit like best used after a teaser element uh, to help your editors who are not maybe that design um, focused to guide them what kind of things they should use. Now, how can we implement this? It's very simple. It's actually just one line in YAML called show in creation dialog. Now to go a bit more into the code, here in YAML we are defining a content headline. Um, it has a label, it has an icon, and then it has a property called layout, which um, offers three options, um, default, gray background, and branded. And then the magic line is here, show in creation dialog. And that's all you have to do. Now, something I also see often is um, that, especially people who are more back-end oriented, don't think how the creation dialog looks. And so you might have a node type called data privacy text, which shows the, the data privacy text from an external service as a node type. It's typically only used once on the whole website, and so it shouldn't be here very, like, in the beginning, in the general. You can group node types in different um, yeah, groups here, and you can put these into the plugins. Plugins is by default collapsed, so normal editors don't see it the first time they're using the Neo CMS. And so it's easier to know what are typical use cases I want to create. And again, in YAML, um, it's just this one line, group plugins. It's not hard. It's only important that you think what your editors expect or how your editors will experience the, the CMS system. Something um, which happens also often is people have like a column layout. And then inside a column layout, you have to manually create the columns. So the first issue here is you see the, the constraints are not applied well. So I can create a column even if I'm not inside a column layout, uh, which will break the layout probably in some kind of way. Um, but the other thing is if I click a column layout, I will probably just have a white block. So as an editor, I want to click column layout. And then I'm asked, hey, how many columns do you expect? And then I see two columns. And then a column layout with two columns is created. Now we can do this in YAML. Um, the way to do it, we have a column layout, which you see is both content and content collection. And in that column layout, the first thing we'll, we'll apply is a, a content constraint. So inside a column layout, only columns are allowed, no other node types. And um, we don't have too much time for constraints in this talk. 
So I want to say there's, um, there's more information on docs.neos.io on how to use constraints um, and how you can use them in a scalable way. Now, in our column layout, we want to have the, uh, the possibility to ask the editor, like, how many columns do you want, and then create those. We are achieving this by using the creation dialog. This can be configured inside of YAML. In the UI section, there is a creation dialog, and I'm creating a new element number of columns, and the editor can choose between one and four columns. Now, in the options, there is a template. This is something we'll see a few times here. Um, and in there, you can define what kind of child nodes should be automatically created. And in this case, we are creating an array range from one to the number of columns. And for each of these, we'll create a section column. And so the column layout automatically gets sections, but it's still configurable, so later on, editors can add additional columns. They can remo like move them around, and they can delete them. So way better than a, a fixed layout. Now, with just these few tips, um, we can um, make it much cleaner. So from something like this on the left side, we can go to something like this on the right side. Now, what else can we do to keep the node types more simple? I slightly mentioned it already. Um, often column layouts look like this, or often column layouts are used and they look like this. First, I have a section, inside that I have a column, inside that I have a text. Then I have another section with two columns and inside each a text block. This can be really cumbersome for editors to create these elements. And then it's hard to understand and then the editor has to figure out how the responsive behavior of a two-column layout might work. Instead, provide simple to use node types and keep the content structure fall, uh, sm flat. <laughs> um, so I can create a text element, and then the text element has a choice with one or two columns. And now, it's way easier if I'm clicking inside the um, editor in the inline editor to get the right node type because selecting the column or the section can be very hard. But with this, it's very easy. The whole thing is one node type and I can click it. And um, a small bonus tip on how you can create these labels on the right side for each node type, you can define how the label is generated. And in there, you can use eel. So here, I'm getting a node property layout. And if the layout is called two columns, I'll call it two column text. And otherwise, I will ca call it text. You can do a lot of funny things with these labels. Now, there's many advantages of building flat structures. It's easier to understand for editors. It's faster because you have fewer nodes and your um, content repository is smaller. It's easier to change layouts, because I already uh, typed in the text, and then I find, oh, the two-column layout works better, or the one-column layout works better, but it's still the same content, so nothing gets lost. And these node types can be responsive by default. So if I'm in a hurry as an editor and I add content, it already looks well, and I only can fine-tune it if I need to. So what we have covered here is um, tips on how to build easy to understand node types. We talked about how you can guide editors through the node creation dialog um, by grouping similar elements into one node type and using the creation dialog about how to um, move rarely used node types to the plugin section and how to use constraints and how to keep the content structure flat. So I hope some of you already had a few ideas they want to take home. Now I want to talk about how to keep the interface clean. So this will be more on the visuals. Um, let's say we are building a very 
I don't know, let's say we are building a, a node type called teaser. And the teaser can have some text, and of course, it has a link where it leads you to another page. You might start with something like this. You have a very simple teaser element. Then your marketing team wants to add an image, and then the node type can have an image. Later on, you're not only using like beautiful images, but you have some kind of graphic inside or something. So you want to switch between um, an image which uses object fit contain, so where the whole image is visible, or something where the full space is used, so um, object fit cover. And then maybe the image should also be able to be on the right side. And then we'll have like this default layout with one width, but we want to have a smaller one. And so we're getting a lot of different um, properties which can be selected in, in, the, in the inspector. So it might look like this. You can set an optional image. You can set the alternative text for the image. You can set where the image position is. You can choose if it's image fit cover or not. You can select the layout width. And you can select the space below the component. Now, it's already a lot of comp like options here. And as an editor, if I start here, it can be confusing, especially if I'm maybe not so used to technology. It doesn't explain alternative text for what. Why do we need an alternative text? The editor maybe types in something. They don't see any change. So it's not clear what the alternative text is supposed to be. You can use help message, messages to help your editors. You see now there's a small question mark icon here. And if you click it, it will explain that the alternative text describes the image content for accessibility and search engine optimization. And there's a link which gives you a detailed description of why you need um, alt text. This is very simple to do in YAML. Every property, oops, every property can have a help message. And in there, you can use Markdown to add images, to add links, to guide the editor through the creation. Now, it still looks messy. So um, the next thing we can do is we can group the properties. Now, in, in this tab, we can create different inspector groups and then move the properties in these inspector groups. So instead of having one which is just called general, I'm splitting it up in two. I have one which is called image, and the other is called layout. Now it makes it a bit cleaner. Um, how does it work in YAML? Just in the node type, you can define inspector groups. You can also put these inspector groups into mixins. And then in the property, you can just use the, the group to move the property there. So this makes it a bit cleaner. And we already have a few icons, which makes it a bit more accessible. We could use even more icons. For example, let's take a look at the image position on desktop. And I have to read it. It says right. Maybe a small icon helps here. It's just one line of code. And so now my image position either has an arrow left or arrow right. And with this, we can add icons for the image position. We can add icons for the layout width, for the space below. It makes everything just a bit more like, accessible. Now there is this checkbox, which is weird. It says, do not use image fit cover. And this is something, it might look odd here, but it happens a lot. Or you have a slider, and it's called not primary layout. Um, why does this happen? Because typically, you create a node type with one default type. Then later on, you add another option. And then you use this negative weird wording so editors can select it by a checkbox. Always use positive wordings. And you can set the default value of this checkbox to 
true, and then you just need to run node repair, and the default values will be added. So we can rephrase this do not use image fit cover to show the full image. A bit better, but you're still not really understanding like what is the alternative. Is the image not shown at all, or why? Wow. So maybe we can call it show the full image instead of cropping. A bit better. But now you see, actually, it is not a checkbox. We are offering two options to the editor. Should the image be um, contained or covered? So why not make a select box out of it? So now, as an editor, I have an image cropping choice. I can choose cover the full area or show the whole image. Now, this is way easier to understand for editors because it explains the options. And in Infusion, it's not much more complicated. Now, we still have a lot of stuff. If the image here at the top is optional, why can I set an image cropping? It doesn't make sense if the image is not set. So what we can do is we can hide unnecessary properties. So imagine it looks like this. So now, if I create it, I can set an image, and I can set layout options. That's easy to understand. Now, if I go in a media browser, select an image, then the properties appear. And now I understand intuitively, oh, these are the properties who belong to the image. This makes the interface way cleaner, and there are so many use cases where you can use it. In YAML, there is something called client eval. So in your inspector, you can set if the property should be hidden or not. And then we're using client eval. And everything after that is evaluated in the browser and it's JavaScript. So we can say, hey, is the node properties image set? Then we want to make it visible. Otherwise, we want to hide it. And for the alternative text, it would look like this. So the alternative text is hidden if the image property is not set. Um, also, sometimes you have a page or a content and it inherits from somewhere else, but the properties don't make sense anymore. So for example, every news page, if you use news SEO, has SEO options. But maybe you're creating a site which is only visible in the back end, and it doesn't make sense that they are visible. Um, or in some cases, title override doesn't make sense, and so on and so on. Um, you can like, remove them from the editing experience by setting the group to tilt. And that way, the property is never visible for the, for the editor. You can also then add a default value, which is different from a normal default value, to automatically make node types work differently without any fusion code. So to wrap it up, the left side was how we started. The right side is what we got in the end. And I think the right side looks way more fun to use. So again, to wrap up my tips, we talked about how you can explain uh, the purpose of properties by adding help messages and by even using markdown. We talked about how you can group um, properties into different inspector groups, um, how to use icons, how to use positive wordings for checkboxes, and that you should always consider visually should it be a checkbox or should it be a select box. And then you can hide unnecessary properties with client eval or with group setting to tilt. So let's move a bit away from YAML more into Fusion. So how can we deliver stunning inline experiences? It always stresses me out, the title. Um, but we'll have some very cool ideas here. So let's say your editor just started a new job and they want to create the first page in the CMS system. So their experience will look something like this. They are opening the editor, they're clicking the plus icon, they're creating a new page, 
and then this is the worst which can happen. As an editor, you're totally lost now. There's a gray area, there's a header, that's it. In most cases, um, the hero element, so is it a text hero, is it a hero image, is it a hero slider, should be part of the, of the page node type. So like already, in, already creates the header as part of the page. Then for the content area, if you really just have this plain content area, at least make it more accessible to editors. So it could look, for example, like this. So now I know where I can click and expect to be able to do something. Um, that's a bit of a cheap hack by just adding a bit of JavaScript to make the main content collection bigger and having a before text. Um, but you can do more than that. And as an editor, let's say I don't only have like page and shortcut, but I have something like this. I can create a page with a hero image. I can create a page with a text or maybe even a whole landing page. And let's choose this one here. And let's say I click on landing page and then I have this. Now as an editor, it's way easy to understand what's going on. It even tells me like here I should write how, how it's the how it's how it is changing your client's work, what does the client get from it, what is our offer. You, you give them a full structure of how a page could look like. And if you take a look at the uh, content tree, you see this is not a hard-coded thing. It created content node types. So these are just recommendations. And if the editor doesn't like one of these elements, they can just delete it. So what we are doing here is in YAML, we are creating a new um, document node type called landing page. It inherits from page, so we are not doing anything special here. We are just using the normal page. We're giving it a new name, of course, and then we are setting different defaults. So the magic thing is here the options template. And what we can do, for example, here is directly on the document node, we can set different um, default properties. So if it's a landing page, it's typically for some kind of ad campaign or something, and it shouldn't appear in the Google search. So um, so you can hide it by default. Now you can define child nodes. We mentioned this already once. And here you can just create child nodes which are good defaults to guide your editor. So here you can see inside the main content collection, I'm creating a content text, and it has some, some description of what the editor should write here. Now apart from this one YAML template, there's not much code. I, I, I mentioned it already, the landing page looks and works exactly like any other page, so it's just one line of fusion. Now that we have talked about how to create document node types, let's talk about how to make it more accessible to have content node types. Um, let's say I'm clicking on create, and I'm creating a text with image. And then it looks like this. Again, I'm totally lost. And as an editor, I would expect something like this. So now I understand, oh, OK, here there's some text and there's an image I should add. Now to get this placeholder text inside your properties, you can define an inline editor options placeholder text. And here you, again, can guide your editor what, what they should do. Should they enter a title here? Should they enter a description text here? Should they enter a teaser text here? Like, what, what's the purpose of this? And then to get the placeholder text, um, in my Fusion example here, I'm using Kaleidoscope, which you, many of you probably already know or saw in the last talk. And I'm just rendering an image based on the property image. And now here, I would not see any image if there's no image set. So let's change this a bit around. Um, 
Yeah, so that's the, the package recommendation. Um, by setting the image source to the properties image and then create a small helper, um, which I called image asset to source. And now we can implement this helper with a simple case statement. So what we're saying here, if there is a value set, which is the image property, then we are rendering the image. Otherwise, if we are in the back end, we are rendering a dummy image source. And if we're in the front end, there's no image set, we don't want to render anything. So now there are cases where the back end should look a bit different or work a bit different than the front end. And the thing which is like the most obvious are links. If you have a link in the front end, if you click it, you want to go to another page. In the back end, you probably want to change the link and you don't want to go to another page. So how can we do that? Um, let's say we start with something like this, where we're getting a link property from the inspector, and then we are getting a text property which we make inline editable. And then in our AFX, it's a link, and inside there, there's a text. Now, every time the editor clicks to change the inline text, it will follow the link. So instead, we can add uh, this property here, where we're saying tag name, and in the back end, the tag name should be a span. In the front end, it should be a link. And then we're changing the, the rendering of the link tag here by using NeoSusion tag, where we're setting the tag name. And with this, we can have a, a link which can be clicked in the back end to add the label, and it can be clicked in the front end to go to another page. Now, there's one important tip here. In, in your CSS code, you should do the styling, not based on the A tag, but instead of classes, so that the button or the, uh, the link looks the same in the back end and in the front end. And there's way more to consider about links. I made it simple here, but based on where you're leading the, the user, you might want to set the dark target blank to go for, uh, for external pages. You want to set a rel attribute. You want to convert emails, telephone numbers, a lot of different use cases. And there's a package called CodeQLink, which, which helps you a lot with this and is based on similar concept as Kaleidoscope, uh, separating the, the presentation and the integration. So does the editor need additional information? It's written here. <laughs> um, there are cases where the editor needs some kind of additional information or editing could be simpler if it doesn't look like the front end. Um, simple cases are a slider, for example. A slider is easier to edit if you have a list of slides than if you have to click through the JavaScript integration. So for these cases, what you can do is you can just add some extra um, HTML which is only rendered in the backend. So just by saying at if Neo's context in backend, I can help the editor with some additional feature or information, and it's only visible for editors. So these are my tips on how to make the inline editing experience better. Uh, we want to guide the editor through the content creation. Um, hero element should be part of content node types, uh, we want to show where the editor can add content. We probably even want to use node templates if it's something the editor does a lot. And we want to always be predictable. So always use placeholder text, always use placeholder images. Now, when you're building, you're integrating the node type, consider when the inline editing experience should look a bit different. 
So links is an obvious one, but it's also not, not a general rule. Sometimes links should even in the back end be links, for example, in the navigation. And um, consider adding a different backend look for interactive elements. Now, with this, you will already build great editor experiences. Now, let's make them love it even a bit more. So, how can we achieve this? Yes, by adding a heart, that's a trick. Um, something which is very common is that pages use News SEO. And in News SEO, for every page, you by default need to manually define the open graph image. And that can be cumbersome. Now, the package was already built for extensibility. So if we look into the source code of News SEO, you see the image is not just implementation, but it's a case statement. So here, we can add our own cases. And for example, if you have a, a page with a hero image, it makes sense that the hero image is a good fallback for News SEO. Or if you have a blog post, and the blog post has a teaser element at the top, that image is probably a very good choice for, for uh, open graph image. So we can do that by just augmenting our uh, page rendering. So here I'm defining it for my abstract page, so all my pages. I'm over or extending the open graph meter tags where I'm adding additional case statements. So I'm saying if the node has a property hero image and the value which is set there is of a type image interface, then we can use this as a good fallback. If not, maybe there is a property called image. That can often be also a good fallback. And now maybe if you always want to have um, preview images and you don't have any other images, it can be a good fallback to say, oh, let's use the open graph image which is de defined on the site. Now, we need to do exactly the same for the Twitter cards. It's basically the same content uh, code. And now we are automatically setting social media default images for most pages. Now, I want to talk about how we can use data from the media browser. Let's say you're creating an image, and the image, of course, has an image itself, uh, which is an asset. And then the image has an alternative text. And then the image also has a copyright information here. So in our Fusion code, um, we'll have our image source will then have an alternative text, which you get from a property. And then we're getting the copyright, which is also a property. And then we're rendering it somehow. So the editor always have, has to enter these three um, like properties. But you probably know the news media browser, and you have noticed there's something called title here. And there's even something called co copyright notice here. So we can leverage that. So instead of having just the alternative text being a property, um, we can switch it to our own helper function, because it will be the same for every image you ever do. And now let's create this small helper. So I'm creating a small helper here, which I called image alt. And as an API, I'm, using the, I'm getting the alternative text from the property. And then, as a value, I'm rendering this out. So now, it still does exactly the same which we did before. It's just more code. Um, of course, that's not the goal. So let's get an additional property image. And since this above is considered API, if your property is not called image, but image2, you can just set it um, when using the helper. Now, if the alternative text is not set, we can say, let's get the title from the image. Now, if in a media browser the title is set, this is a very good choice as a fallback. 
Now, what if there's not, no title set? Now it, it, it gets a bit more tricky. But in many cases, the file name can also be helpful. And so we're adding the file name, and then we want to get rid of the file extension. And then maybe we also replace the underscores with um, spaces. And you see, that already does way more than we had before. And in many cases, so every time the editor defined on the image a title, they don't have to fill in the alternative text anymore. Now, back to the copyright. Does it make sense to set the copyright notice on a node? It doesn't belong there. A copyright notice is always the same based on the image, not on base where I'm using it. So the copyright notice should only be set in a media browser and then used in every place the, uh, where a copyright notice needs to be set. So let's get rid of the property altogether and let's just get the copyright notice from the image itself. So, and now I have one last topic, which is my favorite weekend topic. Um, how can we build smarter layouts? Now, let's say we have a, a teaser grid. How can we build a smart layout for a teaser grid? Um, I have a small demo here. So here, I want to create a, a teaser grid. I'm going to say I want to have it with two elements, and now I have a teaser grid with two elements. If I create a teaser grid with three elements, the three are in one line. Now, the magic is here on the right side, you see there's a property which is um, how many elements should there be in a row on desktop. And by default, it's automatic, but it can be overwritten by the editor. So the editor can say, oh, here, I know I put in three images, but I want to have two in one, one row here. Now, I have these three teasers. Now, if I would create another teaser here, let's see what happens. I'm adding another teaser here, and now the layout changes to a two-column layout. Now let's add another teaser, and now it changes to a three-column again. So how can we do that? Actually, it's not a lot of code. It's just thinking of what would be a smart choice. So by default, we have a property uh, desktop columns, and we're getting the desktop columns based on what the editor entered in the inspector. If they didn't enter something in the inspector, we want to figure out something automatically. So we are counting the number of childs of the node. So our teaser grid knows how many teasers are there. And then we could say if the count is less than four, we are rendering everything in one row. And if there are, for example, four, we are falling back to three because that's the maximum which normally looks good. Now, what, what we've seen here is if I entered four teaser items, it was two in a row, because it makes sense Then it's a, it's a full grid. So you can play and extend that. Uh, we can check if the children count can be divided, for example, by three, and if, if it can be divided by three, then we want to have a three-column layout. If it can be divided by two, we want to have a two-column layout. And this really depends on your layout. Um, but you can do a lot of things automatically. And this is, this is the goal. The fewer clicks the editor has to do, the better. So what we mentioned here is how you can set social media images by default, how you can profit from using data from the, image, uh, from, from the media browser, and how you can build smarter layouts. So there are so many more possibilities to improve editor experience. And um, I tried to get you the, the, the best ones and the ones which are the easiest to implement. Um, so I want to wrap all of this up. And I want to ask you, like for yourself, now, what are the two or three things you saw here today 
which you want to implement after the conference. And just give that a, a second. Now, thank you all for being here. Thank you for staying, staying for a really long talk here. Uh, it has been great that you, you sp spent the time here. And I, um, I want to mention, since there's no time for questions, you can always talk, talk to me at the conference. Also, you can ask me on Slack in the NEOS General by, by mentioning my name, Roland Schutz. And all the code I showed today will be on uh, the docs news IO. And now I want to leave you what, with one final thought. In the end, user experience is how your editors use the CMS. So always adopt to them and see how you're using it and how you can improve their editing experience. Hey. Thank you, right. Roland. Yep. Wow, that was a thorough talk. And <laughs> to be honest, I think you couldn't have left out anything. <laughs> I mean, it's just a whole topic. And um, uh, I, I saw how much effort and love you put into that presentation and everything. It was beautiful and thank shining. So thank you very much. And yeah. as you said, there's not much time left for um, questions. So feel free to ask him. Uh, via Slack, if you like. Yes, and we had three questions we won't be able to uh, answer now, but so please write them to Roland. Or just talk and to me here. Thank you. You're present. Thank you. To what up? Oh, um, can you slide some more drauf machen? Sorry. Um, one last thing. I'll write a tutorial next week, and you can choose. Would you either learn, like to learn more about um, automatic link labels? So if you're setting a link label, how, how we can take the name from the external page, and a few more of these things. Or you, would you like to have a tutorial more on smart layouts? And um, there is a channel, in the news channel, there's now a question, and you can vote there. Thank right. you so much. This one is to you. Thank you.